So, we're going to go around the room, hopefully, and if anything you've been wanting to know for a long time, we've got a question, fire away and I'll do my best to answer. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to know, did, did that actually affect you, the PMRC? Did that hurt, hurt the band at all? Did they try to actually shut you down in any way back in the day? Changed my life, <laughs> if that's what you mean. You know, I mean, it made me more of a recluse. Uh, yeah, you know, a couple thousand death threats and bomb scares and getting shot at a couple of times. It usually has a tendency to alter your outlook on life a little, you know. Um, but also, I mean, we were exposed to extreme fame very early. And fame is kind of like this, if this table was a smorgasbord, it's like an evil genie stands down at the end of the, the, the smorgasbord and said, you can take anything you want, but if you take one thing, you take it all. You do not get to pick and choose. So all the good stuff that you like in the smorgasbord, that's wonderful, but you got to take the bad stuff too. You know, So it ends up uh, being a life-altering experience. One I don't think you can ever really go back to. At least I haven't been able to. Yes, sir. Hi, so uh, I know that uh, over the past couple of decades, you know, music has kind of uh, changed a little bit with how uh, people get exposure for bands and popularity and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what kind of advice would you give to somebody that's really trying to uh, make a name for themselves? you, would you be one of those people? Yes. <laughs> well, I hate to have you come all this way here to hear what I'm going to tell you, but I really have no clue. You know, I, I was having this conversation just a couple of years ago. You know Rod Smallwood is? Man, you know Rod Smallwood, the manager, he manages mm -hmm. us in Iron Man. We were having this very conversation a couple of years ago, and before I could get the question out of my mouth, what you just asked, he goes, I have no clue. I mean, it's like, and if we don't know, I mean, I mean, that doesn't mean that there's not ways to do it. Yeah. You know, but the way, I mean, we were part of the original mold. There was a guy named Emmett Erdogan, and he was the president of Atlantic Records. <clears throat> he built, or he largely built the model that we sold records by for 50 years. And when the record industry collapsed, you know, after the whole Napster thing, that model went away and hasn't really returned the way we knew it. That's not to say that something new won't take its place. We know that every time technology changes, it sinks and decimates one part of show business and then another one will rise up. Think about vaudeville. Vaudeville was killed by silent movies and radio. And then when talkies came into being, they killed the silent movies. You know, and then modern movies and, and TV as we know it. Uh, modern movies and TV as we know it now changed it all again. So every time some new technology comes along, it radically revolutionizes everything. And we're in the middle of another one of those right now. What the model is gonna end up looking like, if I tried to tell you, it would be a guess, so I wouldn't even try to go there and give you some advice that maybe wouldn't be useful at all. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say thank you for everything. Your music means a lot to me, and I just appreciate everything. My question is, uh, what's the one story? I'm going to ask you to repeat the second half of the <laughs> um, What's the one song in your catalog that you say you're the most proud of? I, you know, I mean, it was, it was a labor of love. And it was the one I thought was probably the closest to being perfect. And I wouldn't say that it is. Um, but it's probably the, the closest one, so 
you know, and it's funny because over the years, I've learned to appreciate it in different ways that I didn't in the beginning. Because, uh, you know, when you're the person that makes a record, you never get to hear it for the first time like somebody else does. I mean, I can remember where I was the first time I heard an album that really influenced me. And that you remember where you were and the, the setting where you were and all those things. When you're the person that makes it, you never get that opportunity. You know, so <clears throat> for me to watch it change over the years, I'll give you an example. It's uh, Operation Mindcrime has been compared to the idol a lot and vice versa over the years. <clears throat> when Mindcrime, I, I thought in the beginning Mindcrime was a better record. But over the years, and really it's only been probably the last two years, I would say. I don't think it's a better record. I think they're both equally good. They're just different. They're apples and oranges. You know, so, like I said, my opinion of it has morphed over the years. Yours is still better. Well, like I said, that, I think all art is subjective. You know, so, depending on who you ask, you have 10 people, you have 10 different opinions. First off, my best friend Stat says his love to you and the uh -huh. <laughs> And second, um, what was it like working with all those musicians on Ronnie's Hair and A project? Um, Great question, Troy. We were only there for an evening, so you don't really get the full treatment, I guess, as yeah. if you would have been there. Like, they, had, they were recording for three or four days before we got there. And we had been on tour, and we were late getting there and all that. So we only got there the evening of the last thing. So it wasn't like we were there for the for the whole project. But I would say this, that the guy that produced it was a guy named Ken Cragen. And he was Kenny Rogers' manager and stuff. He, uh, he did the original We Are The World. Yes. And... He had the same son, because we were in the same studio that they did We Are the World in. It was over at AM. And he had the same sign on the front door for us that he had for the We Are the World. And it said, Check your egos at the door. And it was funny because once we got in there, I don't think the sign was even necessary. Right, right. Because everybody was looking at everybody else in there. And it was like, the awesome respect everyone had for yeah. everybody else. The that, like you said, that sign was not needed at all. Right, so right, right. For, that, for what it was, it was a fun experience. Nice, thank you. Do you ever keep any of the old like props from the stages? Because I know the sure. the, the chain link, your original chain link microphones in the UK hard rock. But did you know that it's underneath? It says it's Paul Stanley's. Isn't that bizarre? <laughs> Get him! <laughs> <laughs> so you do, so you do have stuff in the warehouse? What? So you have stuff like you know, stored in the warehouse? Yeah, it's funny because this past summer we went through, we archived all the, the two inch masters. And while we were doing it, we decided to go into the storage lockers that we have and just rip it all apart and see what was there. And boy, we found stuff we hadn't seen in <laughs> ages. And one of the guys that does our social media for us, he told us, he goes, throw nothing away. No. He right. says, we'll no. do an auction next year oh, and nice. give people a chance to get yeah, some. Yeah, that's nice. That's awesome. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I've seen you perform the Crimson Isle in its entirety. Is there any other album that you're considering doing the same thing for in the future? No, I don't think so. Um, I think that's the one that people, I mean, we're going to do parts of it tonight. And even the little snippets that we're going to do this evening, it's a pretty good reaction. You know, we did it in Europe five, six years ago. And uh, it's interesting because that record, it humbles me because I, every night, and I'm not, I'm not joking, every night, I look down at that audience, we get to the end of Misconceptions, and there's, there's people crying out there. It's, that's every night. And it's humbling for me because, you know, to write the lyrics enough to move people, to see them have that reaction, I don't take that lightly. Because when you're writing the lyrics, you always think, well, 
you know, probably eventually whatever I'm cooking up here right now is sooner or later somebody's going to be in the audience mouthing this back at me. And it's always an interesting phenomenon when that happens to me, you know, when I see it because a lot of times I can remember exactly where I was when I wrote whatever line it might be that they're mouthing back to me. And I, you know, I have that juxtaposed in my head of thinking, yeah, somebody's going to mouth this back at me, and now they're mouthing it back at me. And everything goes into slow motion when that happens. It's a very kind of surreal experience, but it's pretty cool. Yes, sir. Okay, so for fans older like me, do you have any tip how to approach our 50s? What kept you going all the years? Passion. You know, it's like, uh, I've often said that the greatest thing anybody can be blessed with is an obsession. Um, if it doesn't wreck your life, you know, because obsessions can wreck your life. The word that we keep using is balance, you know, trying to find balance, you know, in our lives, in our professions. The one thing I've learned, though, over the years is that balance is not just going to come in and sit down in your lap. You've got to grab it and force it with both hands because it will not just come in and do that. It, you have to make a conscious effort to really do it, and if you don't, you're going to look back. I, I, we were watching a special on Motown the other night, and we were on the bus, and somebody said that if you had it to, they were asking one of the guys that was that had run Motown, they said, if you had it to do over again, what would you do different? He goes, I would have slowed it down and tried to enjoy it. Because this is a whirlwind out here, doing what, what we do. You lose track of the days, and you can't remember... You know, I mean, we're halfway through with this U.S. tour right now. And in one way, <clears throat> it's, it feels like we've been out here three months. And in another way, it feels like we've been out here a week. You know, and it's like, it, you know, I was thinking about it today. And it's like, shit, this thing is halfway done. You know, it's like, I wish I could slow it down and enjoy it more. It's that, again, that's back to that duality, that juxtapose I was talking about. You know, where... Wish you could absorb it all, but sometimes you can't. Yeah, I have two quick questions about the, about the Crimson Idol. Do you have any other songs like sitting on the shelf that they, you didn't release yet? Like, you know, you may put out later on. And number two, you have there putting Crimson Idol like on Broadway or like off Broadway, like the who did well, the Tommy? <clears throat> when we did the, the extended video for it, that was that's all it was ever going to be. Okay. Um, it's funny you ask about that. There was a song called Crazy in Paradise that did not make it on the record. When we did re-idolize, I entertained it. It's a really good song. Really good. But it's a little more pop-oriented. And it was about Jonathan's relationship with a, his girlfriend who he was breaking up with. You know, or she was leaving him, effectively. And... The lyrics in it are really, really good. I hate to tease you with this, but it's, it's never, it's never going to... There's no place for it, because when you write a record like that, <clears throat> I had never done one, so I didn't know really how to do that. When you make a regular record, you just compile the songs, and you know when you're done with them, you create a running order. You know, what order do you want these to be in? And you'd be surprised how bands labor over those running orders to get it where the pacing feels just right. Kind of like doing a live show. Well, when you do a, a story, you don't have that option. Because the first song is the beginning of the story. The second song is the second part of the story, and so forth down the line. When you get finished, if you don't like the running order, that's too bad. You know, you better like it. You have to build it as it goes. So to get the pacing of the record to feel right, you want to, like we started out obviously with the overture on that, and then it goes to the Invisible Boy. You know, what's the pacing of those things feel like? So we really had to get the music in place first. Then you start to lay the story in because you can't do it backwards once it's finished. 
So that's all part of the learning curve that you go through when you've never done one of those before. And it's, it, it's not like writing a, a story because it's the story, yeah, you might come up with ideas that you think, well, I'll use this in the middle and I'll use this idea in the end. But that's still a whole lot easier than doing music because, like I said, once that music is laid in place, it goes in stone and you, you can't fix it. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Holmes is using it just to come back recently with Mean, mean Man and uh, video and DVDs. Uh, would you ever consider working with him again? He's doing what? He has a DVD out, videos. He's been touring Canada, Europe. Would you ever consider working with him again? Have you ever been in a bad relationship where a woman left you? Have you ever been in a bad relationship where that same woman left you two times? Oh, yeah. Well, you're nodding your head yes, and you're a lot more sympathetic than me. But would you do it for a third time? I guess not. I don't think I would either. I got you.